everyone, and welcome to the TDWI webinar program. I'm Andrew Miller, and I'll be your moderator. For today's program, we're going to talk about the future of NoSQL databases, and our sponsor today is Scylla. For our presentations today, we'll hear first from James Kabilis with TDWI, and after Jim speaks, we'll be, we'll be joined by Zach Leviathan with Scylla for a panel discussion. Before I turn the time over to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few basics with everyone. Today's webinar will be about an hour long, and at the end of their presentations, our speakers will host a question and answer period. If at any time during these presentations you'd like to submit a question, just use the Ask a Question area on your screen to type in your question. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please click on the Help area located below the slide window, and you'll receive technical assistance. And if you'd like to discuss this webinar on Twitter with fellow attendees, just include the hashtag TDWI in your tweets. Also, if you'd like to make a copy of today's presentation, we can use, you can use the click here for a PDF line there on the left middle of your console. And finally, we are recording today's event and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version so you can view the presentation again later if you choose or if you'd like to share with a colleague. Again, today we're going to be discussing the future of NoSQL databases. And our first speaker today is James Kabilis, Senior Director of Research, Senior Director of Research for Data Management at TDWI. Jim is a veteran thought leader, industry analyst, consultant, author, and speaker on analytics and data management. And over the past three decades, Jim has held analyst positions at Futurum Research, Research Wikibon, Forrester Research, Current, Analy Current Analysis, and the Burden Group. He has also served as Senior Program Director for Product Marketing for Big Data Analytics for IBM, where he was both a subject matter expert and strategist on thought leadership and content marketing programs targeted at the data science community. At TDWI, Jim focuses on data management, which encompasses database platforms, data governance, data integration, master data management, data ops pipelines, and more. Please welcome James, James Kabilis. And with that, Jim, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good day. Yeah, I have uh, Zach Leviathan from Sila DB on in just a moment. Um, we're talking about the future of NoSQL databases. And NoSQL is a very broad category, very broad topic, but it's also highly specific. There are a variety of very important niches within the NoSQL database market. SQLDB is in one of them. Um, and, um, you know, but really we need to stand back when we talk about databases and database management systems and uh, and level set, you know, the present uh, status of the, of the market, uh, how has the market developed? To the present point, what were the requirements and trends that drove the development of a given marketplace to understand what trends will continue and uh, what sort of future shape of this industry will emerge? Over the next several years through this decade, and really no sequel, is really in many ways a broad umbrella for a, a wide range of approaches to uh, storing and managing and enabling analytics and processing of disparate data types. So really the broader perspective, we need to start back at the business level. And really it's all about digital transformation, really companies everywhere are undergoing digital business transformation where data and analytics and digital channels dominate increasingly how you uh, engage with your customer, how you uh, deliver, produce and deliver solutions, both physical and online to your customer to create value for your customer and to hold on to a customer, to attract customers, to get them to re-up for more of your product, hopefully to upsell them. And I often like to, uh, from a business standpoint, like to go back to sort of the square one of really a useful frame of understanding business, what a business is really all about. And management theorist Peter Drucker uh, formulated this overall statement, this overall uh, approach to understanding business, business transformation, but also how businesses engage with their customers years ago when he talked about the fact that uh, really what, what is a business? And that really a business is something that is created to uh, provide value for and to hold on to a customer and really to enrich customers' lives. So the purpose of a business is to create and keep a customer. And when we talk about digital businesses, digitally, businesses becoming digitally transformed, what we're talking about is uh, businesses, of course, are using uh, data to continuously, contextually, and intelligently engage with their customers. 
We're talking about customer data first and foremost, and also the metadata and all the contextual data needed to understand the customer's needs, the customer's profiles, the customer's experiences, um, the customer's sentiments and so forth. So digital business transformation in many ways is all about managing customer data and other data sets to help understand um, how you are delivering value to these customers now and going forward. So when we look at trends in the data database market, really it's all about the convergence of various data types, formats, structures from structures from uns, from uh, structured relational data to semi-structured and unstructured uh, documents and other formats. Um, and when you look at the the diversity of database types uh, in the market uh, and architectures. Um, really, one way to look at it is that the core trend is that these different data uh, platforms and data types and sources are converging in modern business architectures. Uh, they're converging in a way that helps modern developers to tailor ever richer application experiences for the customer, for your multi-channel customer relationship management initiatives, for, of course, your employees, uh, really to drive every aspect of your business front end and back end. So one way to look at the evolution of the database market is that the, the overall core requirements that data platforms have evolved to address, one of which is heterogeneity. And heterogeneity is really the, uh, the need to virtualize and integrate diverse data sources, types, and formats. So data virtualization has been a huge push for a long time. And a lot of this is found all of this is found and addressed in various segments of the NoSQL database market. Temporality, uh, it's about converging your core relational data with uh, time series data, descriptive and real time, predictive, predictive analytics and time series analysis are critically important for lots of, uh, of, of scenarios in terms of data and analytics. Transactionality, online transaction processing, critically important for running any business. Enterprise resource planning, customer relationship management, e-commerce, many apps require strong transactional uh, guarantees, online transaction processing, ACID, you know, uh, atomicity um, uh, and so forth, um, consistency, um, independence and durability are critical importance, uh, critical capabilities in modern databases and not just in relational DBMSs, but also we see a strong uptake of OLTP or implementation of OLTP in the so-called new SQL databases, and uh, which are uh, on one level related to, or, or maybe perhaps depending on the definition within the core scope of NoSQL. Scale, scalability, well, really big data and uh, growing volumes, velocities, and varieties of data. Uh, it's happening everywhere, it, uh, beyond terabytes and uh, to petabytes and beyond. So it's all about databases have evolved to enable more elastic storage and provisioning of processing memory and networking bandwidth um, for ever more demanding scales for data um, and data-driven data applications. Speed, low latency, streaming in memory, event-driven, Data platforms are mainstream now and, uh, and really at the heart of uh, modern experiences in uh, all areas of our lives, and especially in business. Being able to um, do analytics and drive analytics in real time to every uh, device, every application, to mobile and edge computing and the like. Interactivity, on-demand, request response, closed-loop application processing, is a critical capability to see a wide range of database architectures that have emerged to support it, such as key value stores and the like. And contextualization, I mean, it's uh, you know, ubiquitous contextualization by geography, by social networks, by semantic graphs, behavioral graphs, influence graphs, and other graphs, graph modeling, graph analytics, graph databases are a key and very vibrant segment of the whole NoSQL uh, space. So when we look uh, at a high level at the emergence of NoSQL as a convergence paradigm for databases and, and uh, data platforms and data, what we see is that more applications in the business world in our lives ride on virtualized blends of 
all these different data types, relational and non-relational. Um, and so what we've seen uh, going uh, over time is that the need to support very convergence applications like transactional analytics, multi-channel customer engagement, real-time next best action, recommendation engines, in, uh, interactive edge mobility and the like, have required underlying platforms that can virtualize access to and management of all these disparate data types. Um, but also what we've seen is there's been a move away from polyglot persistence, which refers to um, an approach where separate data stores are provided within a virtualization infrastructure behind a, uh, an abstraction layer to new architectures that uh, multi-model databases that can handle all data types and all uh, types of data processing engines, analytics and so forth within a, a, a common seamless architecture can unify the processing of all of this. So really that's no sequel in many ways is the convergence uh, really uh, singularity toward which the database market has been building for years and years. Um, but definitely relational databases are a core component of enterprise strategies as well. So we see a fair amount of uh, uptake of online transactional processing and, and ACID and so forth within the NoSQL arena. So the, the boundaries between traditional relational structured data platforms and the modern world of NoSQL uh, uh, multi-structured data platforms are blurring and blurring. So when we asked at TWM, we asked in our latest data and analytics practitioner survey, what are the top challenges that you, a data uh, practitioner, have faced in managing your data in the cloud? What was clear from the responses is that what, what, what challenges data managers is the need to manage data that is increasingly distributed, heterogeneous, and multi-domain across ever more complex clouds. I mean, data integration across hybrid cloud, on-prem and, and public cloud environments um, is a key concern, a key challenge. A unified governance of all these disparate data types across complex cloud environments, um, a big challenge, um, but also keeping the costs down of managing all this disparate data, um, being able to manage it in a unified way and uh, uh, without, uh, without proliferating silos, uh, really keeping silos and de and reducing silos, eliminating silos and providing a, a, a core uh, data platform that multi-model databases, those architectures have emerged to address. But there's a lot of important niches within the, uh, the uh, NoSQL market that stand alone from each other and support and address key use cases. Um, so don't count out the core uh, category killers in graph database, in wide column, um, in, um, in document database and so forth. These are very vibrant markets and we have some fairly strong players in all these niches. So what I'm gonna ask now is Andrew is gonna introduce um, our primary speaker today uh, in our dialogue and Zach, or, that'll be Zach. So Andrew, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Terrific, thank you so much, Jim, for that great presentation. Just a quick reminder to our audience that if you have a question, you can enter it at any time in the Ask a Question window. We will be answering audience questions in the final portion of the program. This does bring me to our next speaker, who is Sock Leviathan with Scylla. He has a uh, bachelor's and master's degree in computer science and has a, a, had a 15-year career in development, system engineering, and product management. In the past, he worked in the telecom domain, focusing on carrier-grade systems, signaling, policy, and charging applications. Please welcome Zach, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jim. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, hi, Zach, nice to have you here. Hi. So, yeah, I've always, always enjoyed talking with you. So yeah. hey, let's just start out, you know, you're clearly well-positioned in the NoSQL market, uh, CELA DB. So we wanna hear what what is NoSQL and um, where does CELA DB fit into this, this sprawling okay. state? Uh, okay, and uh, thanks for having me, always a pleasure. Uh, so, so of course, there is like the the Wikipedia definition of NoSQL, but I, I will give my own my own variant of that, yeah. which maybe not cover because NoSQL. I just want to mention it's a huge domain, probably thousands of different databases with slightly different trade-off and models. So, really, really a huge topic. I would say NoSQL at least started as relaxation from the model of of. Uh, 
what used to be known as a relational database, your uh, Oracle, MySQL, and such. So some property was relaxed and some property was gained. For example, transaction was relaxed. Some of the NoSQL does not support the same level of transaction, but uh, you gain more uh, availability and more distribution. Uh, some database like MongoDB, for example, a document database relax on the schema and you gain some more flexibility from the application side. So it, it's a, a lot of the parameter in, in, uh, in, in NoSQL database, there is a trade-off. There are many kinds of trade-offs. There is a trade-off between distribution and transaction, distribution latency, schema and flexibility, and, and I can probably count more and more. So each NoSQL database took a different position in all of these dimension and trade-offs. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of uh, capabilities that are generally regarded as under NoSQL. Uh, without getting into too much heavy detail, there's a schema on read and eventual consistency. Are these hard and fast definitions of NoSQL or are these constraints that uh, various NoSQL databases such as your own are pushing against or, or, or relaxing to some degree? Or can? So, so uh, I... I don't think you can say anything about all the NoSQL out there. Any fact right. that you state, I right. will find you. I will find you some exception for that. But but yes. So so uh, features like um, eventual consistency was introduced uh, to handle this uh, distributed system in general, not just databases. Uh, and it's a uh, basically a mech one of the mechanisms that allow you to keep a more highly available system. So if you want a system that can, and I will try to in a few words to summarize the CAP theorem that many people might know. Please. If you, if, if Please. you want your system to always be available, you have to uh, give up on other property, which is uh, full consistency. And it's, it's make a lot of sense because just imagine that you have a two data center or two server, I'm trying to explain it with my hands here, on a distributed one in one region, one in the second region. So the question is, what happens if one of the server is down? So one database said, if one of the server is down, I cannot keep consensus. I cannot guarantee that the data is the same on both server because one of them is down. So I simply block, I block availability, and you cannot read or cannot write. So that will be a more consistent database. A more available database say, you know what, one server is down, I will serve you from the other one. You might get not the most up-to-date data. The data might be stored in a few milliseconds or a few seconds, depending on the model. But you've still been serving. In many, many cases, it, it's, it's preferable than, than not getting serv service at all and, and just think about your, uh, I don't know, your cable or your uh, Netflix or what's not, you still want to get service, even if in very rare cases, you don't get the latest uh, update of what you searched earlier or something like that. So shopping so, cart example and many from the famous Dynamo paper and, and many other examples. Now the CAP theorem, C-A-P, the C is for consistency, the, the A is availability. The P is partition tolerance. So partition tolerance yeah. is enabled under NoSQL often by sharding. Can you explain to our audience what sharding is? Yes. So so sharding is a, is more of a partition before we say partition tolerance. But uh, when you talk about uh, what you, uh, is called big data or used to be called big data, it's not the case anymore that you can fit all of your data into one server. That's not the case for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to Im imply some kind of partitioning between different servers. Uh, in Scylla, for example, in similar database, uh, there is a hash algorithm that randomly, to some extent, split the data into partition. Uh, some uh, can do it themselves. For example, even if you have a relational database, you could just say, hey, I want all the people that start with A to be in this database, all the people that start with B in this database, all the people that start with... So you're doing the partitioning alone. Of course, this is not as flexible because if you need to add, uh, add a letter is maybe not a good example, but if you need to add a more, another partition, it might be hard this way. So in a distributed database, you must have some kind of partitioning, and this partitioning is part of the data model and is very important. Now, Zach, I know that uh, CiliaDB incorporates an uh, approach called uh, wide column stores, and there are, there are other solutions Correct. on the market and open source projects 
new wide column stories. Can you explain what a wide column story is and um, how it, where it sits on the sort of the triangle of the CAP theorem in terms of okay. versus availability versus partition tolerance? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Let me just map Scylla for those of you not familiar. Scylla is indeed what what is called wide column, which I find a little bit of a confusing term. Other um, database in this domain is DynamoDB, Apache Cassandra, and others. Yeah. White column <coughs> by itself, and I'll explain the data model in a second. It's not coupled to any uh, to availability or, availability or consistency. You can actually have it's it's an orthogonal dimension. You can have a white column database which is more on the of consistency, like HBase, and you can have a white column database which is more on the side of availability like uh, Scylla, for example. So the, it's, it's just, it's two different dimension. Uh, wide column, uh, you can think about it, the one way to think about it is an extension of key pair database. In a key pair database, you have, again, and sorry, I'm, use, I'm using my hands all the time, but you have a key and you have a value. The value, of course, can be complex. It can be a structure or something like that. Uh, but all the, the keys in the database are not order in any uh, order which is have a business sense. It's just a random hash order. Hmm. On a Scylla or write column database, you, you extend it by a little, which means a lot. You have a key, what is called a partition key. You have another key, sometimes called clustering key or ordering key in DynamoDB. And then you have the values. Mm -hmm. And this small change allows you to do a lot a lot and add a lot of power. Let me give you a quick example. In many IoT use cases or time series that uh, use cases, you have a partition key as a sensor, a clustering key as a timestamp, and then the value. And then in this data structure, you can ask queries like, give me the last day of values for this sensor. Uh, this very natural and seems to be very useful query is simply impossible in a key pair modeling because there uh, you, you cannot order uh, uh, the keys inside the partition. You simply don't have this property. And in Scylla and um, other databases, it do have this property, which is very useful. Hmm. Great. So, you know, when we look at the NoSQL market, and there's so many different niches that it's hard to generalize um, across them, but really, you know, what are the business and technology trends that have been driving this market development of these various niches? including wide column store over the last 10 to 20 years, and will they endure? So uh, relational databases are still around, uh, but the NoSQL segments have come on strong. So what are the sort of the chief trends? Let's just take it from the point of view of CLDB. What are the chief trends in the market that are driving the adoption of wide column store databases? So, so I would say uh, big data, uh, and data is, is, we call it big data, I think, 10 or 15 years ago, but we yeah. become bigger and bigger. So maybe we need to, to find a new term, huge data, I don't know, Mongo's data, whatever. But data is only increasing the number of, of, uh, of system and the number of sensor and the number of device in the world is, is just increasing and increasing. All of them are collecting data, good or bad, <laughs> that's how it is. And people need to store this data in, in a way that allow them to use it in a useful way. So definitely that's a trend that continue and will continue. Um, uh, second, trace, second trend, which is, uh, I mentioned it earlier, is availability. Mm -hmm. um, database and system in general, it's not that it has become much distributed. You have customers all around the world. All of them want uh, low latency. All of them want to see the data quickly. So splitting the data between region, basically between continents sometime, is becoming more and more popular. Right. And, and it's it's not just the case that you can naively partition the data between country and each country just access its own data. The fact that you have an account in the US doesn't mean that you are not currently in Europe and you still want to access your account. Um, so you do need like a global synchronization between all of this region, but it doesn't have to be completely synchronic. Maybe right. it can be asynchronic, maybe you, you want something more tunable. So I mentioned uh, just the big data, the availability. And I would say something else which is may, might be more specific to Scylla, uh, we see more and more people are looking for low latency uh, use cases. 
And low latency, of course, it, it's very uh, common on, on things like ed tech or gaming or things like that. But it's actually mm -hmm. important in many other domain like IoT right. and and the uh, video streaming and things like that. Um, aren't aren't Y Comstar databases also highly distributed? So are they geared to a world of edge computing and mobile computing? Um, is that another key trend? Yes, definitely. I would say that that it's not a, there is another domain that I don't want to get into of, right. of edge databases, databases right. that are actually running the browser and things like that. Very cool development in this domain as well. Scylla right. and other wide column is not in this space because they are built for huge data, as I mentioned. So they are usually in the center of, of the network, if you will, but the center can be distributed. Mm -hmm. so, so it's it's like, uh, maybe I'm contradicting myself here, but, but you usually have like a few data center. Each of them can hold many, many terabytes of data, even petabyte of data. Yes, that's a tiered architecture. You know, there's a really a distributed center is not an oxymoron, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're gonna move, keep moving. Um, so what are the prime use cases for the diversity of NoSQL database architecture. So really, when we stand back and we ask, there's, there's like document databases, what are they good for? What are graph databases good for? Uh, that, in other words, when the enterprise data professional is trying to understand for their latest project, what type of database they should incorporate from this broad umbrella called NoSQL, um, how do they go about it? I mean, how do they, they scope out? Well, this is a wide column store application. What, what sort of tips or guidelines would you give them to sort through the field of possible architectures? I'm not talking about particular vendor products, but yeah, yeah. how would one approach, you know, narrowing it down to a short list of, okay, is it going to be either key value store or wide column, or it's going to be either document or graph? How do they do that? Yeah. So first, there is there is some overlap between all of these domain. Yeah. Um, so I would I would start splitting the domain into a few categories. So the first decision is, is it a real time database or an analytic like database? Right. Um, and, and it's usually two different domain inside the NoSQL, uh, which very different uh, requirement. Uh, analytic, in a typical analytic uh, database or analytic use case, you ask ad hoc queries. Right. Uh, and, and the latency is important, but not as important. So, for example, if I'm asking, please analyze how many people in the US wear hats in the winter or what's not based on cameras. So, right. it's an interesting question, and you don't care as much if you get an answer in five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, rather, in a real a uh, real-time database like Scylla and other, um, you need an answer in in a millisecond or close to millisecond because right. it might be like in a gaming application when you move your place and actually translate a few a database query that need to respond very fast. The same goes for EdTech and other domain. So that's that's one of the splits. Hmm. Uh, so let's let's go even in the real time. There is more and more. Uh, so the question is, how much data do you have? Hmm. If you only have a few gigabytes of data, an in-memory database might be good enough for you. Right. Uh, Redis is a popular one. Sorry for, for throwing out the trends here, but uh, names. Um, so no. you, if, if you can fit all of your data in in-memory of, of a server or a few server, um, you might be that might be good enough for you, like a cache in memory cache. If your data is is terabyte or petabyte, then again you need something else. Uh, and then you ask yourself, do I need a fully highly available database, mm. or can I put all the data on one data center? So all of these questions lead you to different, and there is a tree of of uh, different options, different database set that you can choose. You know, and and the data. A professional might get a little bit confused because some um, there's a, a segment of the market referred to as new SQL, NEW SQL. Yeah. What are your thoughts? How does that differ, if at all, from no SQL? Isn't that isn't that on some level a, a, a kind of munging together of no SQL in terms of the scalability and all that with a bit of SQL, meaning like OLTP asset guarantees, or am I confusing the matter? 
No, it's, it's, it's accurate, and, and it's a relatively new trend in a few years. When I mentioned earlier that when NoSQL started, uh, a lot of, some of the requirements was relaxed to gain availability. Right. And one of, the, one of the requirements that was relaxed is, is full SQL support and transaction support. Right. But in recent year and in recent, with recent paper and recent work, uh, some database actually managed to, uh, to merge both distribution and to some extent availability and also uh, support uh, full transaction and full SQL. But of course, that's come like everything in, in computer science, that's come with a price of its own. Uh, so if you compare uh, uh, no, uh, NoSQL to NewSQL, uh, you will find that uh, if you do want to support SQL, you must pay for it in, uh, usually in uh, latency. And this latency comes from the fact that you need to keep uh, synchronization between all the nodes and consensus between all the nodes in the distributed system. Uh, practically, you just need to send a lot of messages between the nodes uh, to get to a consensus. And these messages cost in latency and cost in time and cost in processing. So the end result of this database, which some of them are very, very cool, by the way, uh, still cannot compete with, with no SQL XL in performance. And, and of course, they have other properties, so, so, uh, which are useful by themselves, like transactions. So you have a trade-off here. What is more important to you? If performance, low latency is critical for you, you might choose Scylla. If full-blown SQL is important to you, you might choose something else. OK, great. So move on to our next question. Um, what are the optimal <laughs> roles, the optimal roles for NoSQL databases in enterprise cloud data and distributed environments. And I'll interpret the term uh, roles here to mean deployment roles um, in the cloud, at the edge, do different types of NoSQL database have different optimal deployment roles? Are some better suited for, uh, for the edge computing? Are some better suited for, for highly scalable, you know, uh, it, 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 it deployment at the core of a cloud? Are some databases uh, under the NoSQL umbrella, um, well suited for deployment in any of those roles. W what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, so, so my focus usually, as I mentioned, is database on the center of the cloud. Yeah. And w and when I say cloud, it doesn't it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily one of the cloud provider like AWS, uh, GCP, or Azure. You can have many people run uh, Scylla, for example, either the open source or enterprise version on prem. Uh, on the own data center because yeah. some of some of the operation are uh, too big or it's too expensive for them to run on the cloud or they have enough confidence and technical knowledge to run their own data center so that's a useful use case one other use case <coughs> sorry which we've seen lately is in hybrid model you have hmm. in the same database is distributed one data center on the cloud one data hmm. center on prem Hmm. And everything is, is, is synchronized, so you can uh, more easily manage your expenses, but still be uh, very highly available. Uh, so that's, that's become a typical uh, use case that we're seeing more and more. I'm seeing a fair number of those kinds of uh, deployment, uh, distributed deployment uh, models uh, taking place over like containerized, like Kubernetes fabrics, uh, where the same database, uh, at least an instance of the database, is deployed in in a kube container, or in a, in a virtualized container uh, on the edge, and all, another one in the cloud in different zones in the cloud, and then they are orchestrated as a logically unified database. <laughs> Do you see that kind of a cloud native orchestrated yeah. deployment model uh, for distributed data uh, bases becoming standard over the next few years, or still yes, or, or the yes, and not that is it too complex? Yes, and not. Not, sorry for jumping in. Yes, and not just for databases. The, the trend is obvious. Everyone is moving to Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's that's for, I, I guess, databases are the last to join the party because uh, <laughs> Kubernetes was created and uh, designed to some extent for, for a stateless application. Yes. And using stateful application on it is still a challenge to some extent, but, mm. but the, the market the market has spoken and everyone is moving to Kubernetes. I would and uh, Scylla included, of course. And, and what I would say uh, regarding Kubernetes is that 
uh, at least for us as a database who focus on performance, it, it was a challenge to keep the performance and the low latency on Kubernetes because like any kind of abstraction layer that you add to the system, you, you add latency. Yeah. Um, and, and if you still want to keep like millions and millions of requests per second on the server with a latency of a millisecond, you have to, in some cases, optimize all of the layer in the middle to, to continue uh, serving this request. And that's, that's why moving to Kubernetes was not trivial to us, but I'm happy to say that we, okay. we uh, managed to do that. Is there still a role in, in a, will there still be a, a role in the Kubernetes distributed database uh, world of the future for bare metal or close to bare metal deployments of databases? Your thoughts there? I would say yes. One of the, one of the things that we try to do, at least on Scylla, not all, each database is different and some database does not focus as much about performance. They focus on other properties, but at least for Scylla, because we are very much focused on performance, we try to uh, cross all of the layer of the abstraction and run in a very similar performance to bare metal. And by the way, when I say bare metal these days, I'm actually referring to a VM on the cloud, <laughs> no, okay. not to bare, not to bare <laughs> metal. So, so there is a bare metal hypervisor VM Docker yeah, yeah, yeah. on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, so yeah, so relative now to what, what your frame of reference is, bare metal. Yeah. yeah. So, so but by the way, the, some of the cloud provider do provide bare metal, so it's it's not really uh, oxymoron this. And then there's also serverless, and we have a lot of serverless databases in, in you know cloud environments and SaaS kind of environments. So the, the marketplace in terms of deployment models for databases, um, <laughs> prem on prem. Um, you know, um, it, 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 over Kubernetes or serverless or at the edge, it's there's a lot of uh, uh, options that database uh, data architects can take advantage of. I'm, I'm going to move on to our next question, which is, um, you know, when we look at the emergence of what are often called multi-model databases that can handle all disparate data types in a unified st storage engine, with unified management and so forth, and load on demand as needed, the processing engines associated with each data type. You know, Zach, is there still you know, a, a role for, is there still a practical distinction between SQL and NoSQL in a market where pretty much all data types can be processed more or less with a relatively equal performance uh, in these new converged architectures? Are the holy wars, um, are the database yeah. holy wars ending? So, in my opinion, no. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the reality is that uh, some of um, the data modeling uh, directly impact performance. Um, so, for example, if you if your data if your data model is limited to keeper or to white column, your entire architecture, including the storage format, the file on the disk, etc., all match this deployment. So what you can do, and, and of course some people do, is running some kind of uh, unified engine on top of all of these databases practically and collect information from all of them and bring it as a result. And that's, that's fine for analytic use case. But if you're talking about a real-time use case, um, then this model usually does not hold, and then you need a specific data storage. Of course, in theory, you can build uh, um, like like put a roof on top of different storage engine and different database and, and have like a unified kind of a unified API to serve all of them. But in practice, it's this abstraction, at least in my opinion, does not give a lot of value. And, and in many cases, it's better for the developer to just use the API that is needed and know exactly which API return in 10 seconds and which API return in one millisecond. Hmm. Great, so we'll move on to our last question for the audience Q&A. Um, so from the enterprise uh, data professional's point of view, what are the greatest challenges that they face when they've deployed NoSQL data platforms in the cloud and they're trying to achieve the full value from that deployment? In other words, are there issues like providing strong governance over multi-structured data uh, sources, is that a cheap 
barrier to, for example, implementing a so-called single version of the truth over NoSQL? Are there issues with performance of NoSQL or scalability or transactional guarantees that can prevent an enterprise from achieving the full value from their deployment or from addressing a wider range of use cases successfully? Really, what are the gotchas or what are the limitations of NoSQL yeah. enterprises face? Or is it an unlimited field of, of great products and solutions and architectures so, that so has all, yeah. everybody? All of the above, <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say I would say that de definitely managing multiple database is a yeah. challenge. Usually, most enterprises that I'm talking with have at least ten different databases, sometime more. Uh, so managing them is a challenge, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, each of them have its own um, its own property. By the way, a, a typical data team will manage not just database. So they have 10 database, but they also have like five streaming maybe, mm. and, and an analytic engine, et cetera. And, and all of them are distributed. So handling all of this component is challenging. This is one of the reasons that we are seeing more and more enterprise moving to manage service. Uh, so they're basically saying we like Scylla, but we, we don't we don't know how to manage it. We don't want to know how to manage it. Please manage it for us. And the same goes for, of course, for other database and other system. So that's reduced the friction to some extent, but st you are still have to manage different system. Even if it's managed, you have to connect them and glue them together. So there is there is still work for uh, the DevOps team and and uh, <laughs> and the people and and uh, they're likely to keep their job. I would say it this way. Great, great. Um, I think we're going to hand it over to Andrew uh, to start the audience Q and A. Thank you, Zach. So we're going to we'll stay on the line, of course, and we'll take your questions. So, Andrew. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that great discussion. Uh, we'll jump right into the audience question here. Uh, so the first question will be for you, Zach. What is the NoSQL sweet spot, and what is Scylla's sweet spot? Okay. Uh, so I will answer Scylla first because it's easier for me. Uh, so Scylla Sweet Spot is a, a use case which uh, includes uh, big data, a lot of data, terabytes or petabytes of data, high availability and low latency. And, and take it in from a different direction. If, if your data is only a few gigabytes or, or even, I don't know, a few hundreds gigabytes, maybe you don't need Scylla. Maybe it's an overkill for you. Uh, but if you do have a lot of data, Scylla might be a good solution for you. On general NoSQL, there are many, many use cases. Um, so it's really a very broad question. So it, it's a little hard to, to answer in each, in a search use case, in a document use case, in a graph use case. E each of them is a, have its own sweet spot. I, I hope this answers the question. Uh, yeah, I think it did. Uh, Jim, this one will be for you here, uh, but of course, Sark, if you have any uh, anything to add, please do so. So, Jim, which, if any, type of NoSQL database technology is the most advanced? What is most advanced? It depends on your definition of advanced. I think all of them are advanced. They, they've all emerged as vibrant market spaces with many competitors who offer robust <laughs> products to address sweet spots of their own. I mean, Zach has very clearly articulated what CELADB is addressing. So, you know, in many ways, um, database management, you know, long ago, it, relational databases were the apex of, of technical achievement in, uh, in, in management of data, which it, for, for a long time was just associated with structured transactional data. Now that pretty much every type of data, there's so many different types of new data coming along and each have got their optimal data um, architecture um, for highly focused uh, requirements. It's really hard to say that there's any one architecture that's more advanced than another. There's not necessarily one grand unifying singularity data architecture coming into place that'll do everything equally well. And in fact, organizations quite often, enterprises in our, in our research, 
um, prefer to have a multi-platform approach where they will deploy uh, relational databases for the things that those are good for, deploy uh, white column stores for what they're good for and so forth, and, uh, and provide a, you know, and enable them all those different data bases, data architectures to share, um, you know, common cloud computing platforms, common, uh, you know, uh, automated um, data management capabilities, autonomous data you know, management and so forth. So what we see, so what's really advanced is not so much the underlying data model or database architecture. What is really advanced is the, getting more advanced is the degree of automation of what DBAs used to have to do manually. Um, so when you look at, you know, really automation, AI ops, as governing the autonomous deployment and management of databases. That's where the true advancements are happening in this market from what I can see. Terrific. Uh, we'll move on to the next question here. Uh, Zach, this is for you. If we started building a new SQL database today, how might it be architected? Uh, okay. F first, I will advise you not to, just because it's a very challenging a many, many years effort. And I would argue that uh, you can, uh, I would say first take a hard look at what available out there before you start building a database. <laughs> and af after eight years in this domain, I, I can say it. Uh, but, but I would say that uh, first, before you jump into architecture, understand the requirement that can be many, many different kind of requirements to the database. I mentioned earlier, is it an analytic or real time? Is it, is, do you need to, to search in free text or do you have a key and such? Once you decide on that, uh, you can move forward. Um, other element that, that uh, different databases take different decision on is, for example, is it distributed or not? If it's distributed, there is a rich uh, domain of consensus algorithm that people are using, which is advanced pretty fast. Uh, algorithm like Craft and Paxos and such. Uh, there is a lot of work around the efficient uh, storage engine. Uh, Scylla and other databases using LSM, a log structure tree to, to, uh, to store the data, and there is a lot of work in this domain. Um, and in uh, hardware, there is also advanced like uh, outdoor and, and the Linux uh, kernel above it. There is thing like iRing and there is and new uh, CPUs and new SSD with new capability. Um, so there is a lot and a lot of, every layer of the database have a lot of investment and I would pick the latest <laughs> of them all. All right, we'll move on to the next one here. Zach, also for you. What makes NoSQL a better fit for highly distributed applications? Uh, good question. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the, there is a database that do offer SQL and distributed database, so, so it's it's not uh, it's not completely orthogonal. But no SQL do fit it better, in a sense that it's uh, simply omitting some of the uh, SQL operation like join and foreign key, which are very hard to implement on top of, on top of a distributed database. And if you do implement it on top on top of distributed database, it includes a lot of messaging and a lot of work to achieve consensus. And one one thing that I mentioned at the start, closing the loop from the start, that uh, in NoSQL you relax some of the requirement and can gain other things. So if you relax the requirement for transaction, for example, or join, you can achieve much simpler solution and, and with much higher performance. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, uh, terrific. Yeah, no problem. Um, Jim, this one's for you here. Um, is a multi-model database a type of NoSQL database? I believe you touched on this, but perhaps you can expand. Yeah, you know, really, you know, it depends on your definition of a NoSQL database. And a working initial definition, at least 10 years ago, was a NoSQL database supported non-relational data structures and you know, multi-model databases very much do. Supports schema on read and definitely you know, multi-model supports schema on read. Supports eventual consistency and yes, they do. But multi-model databases also support relational data, um, schema on write, um, and also uh, you know, guaranteed 
transactional OLTB asset consistency? So the answer is yes and no. So a multi-model database enables you to support a the full breadth, uh, a fuller breadth of, of data-centric applications, um, relational, the SQL and the non, no SQL together. So in many ways, it's it's superset, as it were, of the no of the entire database market. Perfect. Uh, Zach, over to you for this uh, next question. What business pressures do you think will have the greatest impact on NoSQL? Um, okay. I, I would say a few. One we mentioned earlier is a transition to, to the cloud and to manage service on general. Uh, and that's not unique just to database. And that's one. A second is the, also mentioned before, is the data is keep increasing. So there is more and more and more data and, and the people need database that can handle terabyte, petabyte. And I don't remember what the name of the size above petabyte, but, but uh, I'm sure in the next Excellent. few years we will. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure in the next few years we all, we all have to learn it like we learned the, the previous one. And the, so the data is just continue to increase in, moving to the cloud. And one, one last thing that I will mention that uh, with, with the, the latest uh, economic uh, weather, I would say, uh, teams are looking to focus on what they are strong with and not uh, do more than they need to. And, and uh, that's drive the result for managed services. So it's not just the cloud, it's also managed. Because you can, and many people do, run your own uh, database on the cloud, but still ha manage it yourself. I think at least in Scylla, we are seeing many people um, moving away from admining their own databases to a managed service. Perfect, I think we have about two questions left here. Uh, so Zach, this one again for you. What is tunable consistency? Ah, okay. T tunable consistency is a, is a feature in uh, Scylla that was inherited from uh, a more uh, uh, older database like Apache Cassandra and uh, Dynamo. Uh, and it's basically allow you to set the consistency per request you can say I'm, I'm writing, I'm, I'm doing, a, for example, a write request to the database, and I, I want to have a full consensus uh, for this request. So uh, the client wait for all the nodes or quorum of the node to respond before he mark it as success. Or you maybe write like an IoT sensor or something like that that need to write and don't really, and don't have any action to do if it's failed. So we just write and forget. So you can set the tunable uh, consistency to one or to any or things like that. And uh, in, in many databases, this kind of consistency is set as part of the system. In Scylla and other databases, it's actually tunable and you can set it from the driver or from the application side. So you get a lot of flexibility. Terrific. And uh, the final question again, last one here for you, Zach. What in Scylla architecture makes it faster than other databases? Uh, a lot of things. I would say that, that uh, one of the main uh, design principles or the goal when uh, Scylla started was a high performance and low latency. I would say that the, the, the major one that started all of it was to implement it in C++ and specifically in a shard per core architecture. So um, in Scylla, we have a zero context switch. We have a thread that run on each core and never switch. Uh, and as a result, of course, everything has to be completely asynchronic. All the disk, uh, the IO operation, the network operation, everything is asynchronic, even passing messages between different core on the same machine. Each core has its own chunk of memory. Uh, so everything is asynchronic, and this, these are the two main decision that uh, lead to performance, but what we are doing for the last eight years is basically improving performance with more and more optimization. And so we definitely not, a, there is no silver bullet for performance and it's an ongoing work. I believe you also do automated performance tuning, is that correct? That's correct. We have uh, what is called, what we call a scheduler that uh, manage all of these resources like IO. 
and, and try to, to schedule all of the requests to get the best performance. And also it's allow the user in the feature that we call a workload prioritization, allow the user some control of this uh, performance property. So you can say, this query is very important for me, please execute it first or with low latency. This query is maybe less important and maybe you can put it uh, backward in the queue. Um, so we are exposing this scheduler uh, API to the user as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, this brings us to the end of our time today. So allow me to thank our speakers. Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Zach. Uh, really, really great presentations and discussions today. Uh, I'd also like to thank Scylla for sponsoring today's webinar. And please remember that we did record today's webinar. We'll be emailing you a link to an archived version of the presentation, which you can feel free to share with colleagues. Also, don't forget, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can use the click here for a PDF line. Lastly, I'd like to remind you that TDWI offers a wealth of information, including the latest research reports and webinars about BI, data warehousing, and a host of related topics. So I encourage you to tap into that expertise at TDWI.org. Lastly, from all of us here, let me say thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's event.